You know, like a lot of people, what was it, about 20 years or so ago now, uh, when the Left Behind series came out. How many of you guys read that series? All right, not as many as I thought, actually. Surprising. Cool. Uh, you know, I read it. I enjoyed it. Um, I, I thought it was a, it was a good work of, of fiction in a lot of cases. That's what they were trying to do. They, they took some liberties uh, to make it kind of an apocalyptic fiction of sorts. But I think reading those books, maybe their greatest contribution to, to Christendom, if you will, is in showing us just how easily something that is normally so hard for us to grasp, uh, the apocalypse, it's, it's kind of this nebulous, theoretical, theological abstraction that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around. And that series showed us just how easy it is for those things to come to life, to be part of reality. Taking an abstract theological truth and bringing it down to something concrete um, and, and real is very often my task as a preacher and as a teacher. That's the fun part of, of digging through the scriptures and preparing for a sermon. It's also the really hard part sometimes. But in all actuality, there's always a way to find something solid to ground biblical truth in simply because it, it is the truth that best reflects the reality of life. Lately, as we've been working our way through Matthew, Jesus has been talking about this big theological idea of the kingdom of heaven. And he's been telling his disciples, different things about it, even as he's exposing the existing and the growing opposition to the kingdom of heaven. But the big picture now is we're heading out of chapter 13 and all those parables and into chapter 14. We're crossing that bridge today. The big picture is that our worship of Christ is a reflection of our belief in Christ. Who is he? Is he the son of God? Is he a really good teacher? Is he maybe something even less? What we believe about Jesus will determine everything about how we worship Jesus. And it certainly impacts how we think about the world, how we make decisions, just how we live our lives. So we're moving out of the parables, but Matthew is not losing his train of thought in here, okay? He's, he's got a plan, and he's working through it. So today, what we're going to start with, uh, Bill's already alluded to it, we're going to start with two pictures of unbelief, right? He's going to show us how easily unbelief really shows up in life. And in the following weeks, um, we're going to have two pictures of two contrasting pictures of the disciples' growing belief and growing faith. But we're starting out with unbelief today. So Matthew's going to continue building on what Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom of heaven. And he's going to show uh, the deeper, but, but that kind of abstract truth about those parables in real life right now. So he's going to start now with these two pictures of unbelief, these two pictures of the seeds that the sower sowed that fell on the path and got eaten up by the birds. You guys remember that, right? It's not too long ago. Remember the parable of the sower? Parable of the soil? Lots of heads nodding. Yeah? Amen. Great. Good. That's what we're doing. So I think we're going to be able to pull a few insights out of these two pictures of hard hearts that have a warning and an application for us uh, even now as believers. When I... Uh, first started seminary. You know, we were at a church in North Carolina. Uh, Lee was there with us as well. Um, and I remember as I was still trying to figure out uh, kind of what, what this path looked like, what my ministry path was going to look like, what God had in store for me, um, there was a period of time where it crept into my head, hey, maybe I'm supposed to become the pastor of the church I'm at. And we, we had an aging pastor who was incredibly supportive to me 
uh, during that time, but he had you know, not made it a secret that he wanted to retire sometime soon. And so there were these visions of sugar plums, if you will, dancing in my head about, hey, maybe this is what it's supposed to be. Maybe I'm supposed to get through seminary and become the pastor here. But passages like we're going to start with also kept popping into my head, um, and I finally discarded the notion altogether, and I think very wisely, because as I got to think about it more, in, and I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, don't think that, um, but when you look in the Bible and you read accounts like this morning's, and you read about the prophets and, and some of those kinds of things, you find out that a prophet has no honor in his own hometown. And I knew that when push came to shove down the road at this church, and I started trying to push them in one direction or another if they didn't like it, it was very quickly going to become, well, who do you think you are to tell us what to do? You were just one of us not too long ago. You're not special. That's life. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 53. This is Jesus' experience on something similar. When Jesus had finished these parables, he departed from there. All right, we've wrapped up our parables now. He's departed from there. And he came to his hometown, Nazareth, and began teaching them in their synagogue with the result that they were astonished and said, where did this man acquire this wisdom and these miraculous powers? I want to stop right there. So this is Jesus now. He's come into his hometown. He hasn't been there for a while, but he's been out. He's, he's getting involved in ministry and, and been out there. Word is spreading. He shows up in his hometown and he goes to the synagogue and he begins teaching. This should be an amazing blessing for the people of Nazareth. Here is this renowned teacher, very well respected, thought of, showing up, sitting down, teaching them. And it's not that they didn't get it or see it. It says in the passage, they were astonished. They saw what he was doing, and they had heard what he was capable of. And they were saying, where did this guy get this wisdom and these powers? They recognized he had wisdom and power. It's not that he showed up like a wallflower and a back row Baptist sitting back there being quiet, saying nothing, and they didn't know who he was. He had a reputation, and they saw the wisdom of his teaching, and they knew of his power. They didn't miss that. But it goes on, verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is his mother not called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man acquire all these things? We know him. How can he be anything special? You know, we've come across it before where somebody said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? I never would have thought the people of Nazareth would have felt the same way, but they did. We know you. You can't be anything special. You know, Gaston County, where we moved from in North Carolina, um, it, it's a mill county. Um, it's, you know, low income. It's got a, a long history of mill work and, and fabrics and all those kinds of things. But one of the things that you find that has held that county back for a long time is the attitude that kind of has continued in some ways um, through people that have been involved in the mills for a number of years where education is not important and, and things of that nature because their attitude is, don't get above your raisin. We didn't need all that. You don't need it either. This is kind of the same idea here. Who's this guy to think he can waltz in here and start teaching us this stuff? Well, he's really wise. I don't care. We know him. That's where they're coming from. And they took offense, verse 57 tells us. That's, uh, the word that they use is being repelled by somebody. It's not this, just that they didn't like him. Like, he made them mad. Who do you think you are? They were repelled by him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown and in his own household 
And he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Familiarity breeds contempt. That, that's kind of our modern day uh, cliche if we want to throw it with this. Familiarity breeds contempt. This is idea in Nazareth that if somebody was worth anything, they wouldn't have come from there. And I can tell you, everybody's got to come from somewhere. Do they not? Even the Messiah, and that's not even what we're talking about in this context. Even the Messiah has got to come from somewhere. But no, because you grew up with us, because we know you, we're not giving you the time of day. A prophet is not dishonored except in his hometown. It seems like an obvious one to us, I think. When we start talking about unbelief, it's really easy for us to very quickly draw the line and just say, okay, we're talking about believers and unbelievers. And you know what? He's talking about unbelievers today. He's not talking to me. No, <laughs> no, no. Everything in the Bible is for all of us. And I think as we're sitting here in this church, and many of you have been faithful to attend this church for probably more years than I've been alive in some cases, a long time, there's a danger that someone can sit in a church like this or any other church around the country, around the world, and sit in here long enough and hear a gospel message every Sunday and hear Bible accounts and Bible truth and doctrine preached and hear it every single Sunday and not be converted. And every Sunday you hear it your heart gets a little harder to it. And you may not feel that way. And I'm not trying to make everybody question their, their assurance this morning. Don't think that either. Um, but healthy self-reflection self is always good. We can be exposed to those things and become familiar with them. And we can stop recognizing the power of that truth and how much impact it should have in our lives. We can't become numb to that. Today, we can look around in our communities and we can clearly see that many people have heard of Jesus. They throw his name out there every time they stub their toe. Lots of people have heard of Jesus. They've even seen evidence of his work in the lives of some who follow him but they still deny him the worship that he is due. And it's so easy to blame not wanting to be in a church, for instance, on the hypocrisy of people they see in the church. And there's a little bit of truth to that. But there's also a lot of people that fill pews in churches that may call themselves Christian and still be unregenerate, and still be walking the broad road. Yeah, that looks really hypocritical. It is. But at the end of the day, that is not what keeps people out of the church. It's not the hypocrisy of the church. Jesus didn't call us to put our faith in people anyway. At the end of the day, what keeps them out of the church, and what keeps them from following Jesus, and worshiping Jesus the way that they should is their hard hearts. Plain and simple. It's a hard heart. And the world and the culture is always going to feed hard hearts. It's always going to make it more difficult. They're going to try to fatten up those hard hearts and make those hard hearts even stronger. That's what the world does. But there's a little bit of Mm, debate, maybe. If, if we look at this passage, here's how it ends, verse 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. If you actually go read the parallel passage in Mark, it says, and he could not do any miracles there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. They both agree Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. But which one is it? He, he did not or he could not. 
It's an interesting discussion. And as we get into belief and unbelief here, unbelief comes from a, a Greek word that means disobedience and distrust, and usually disobedience that follows distrust. I think that's probably how those two things work together. You don't obey something you don't trust. It's the opposite of faith, but we don't have the word unfaith. But if you want to look at dis- or unbelief, unbelief and unfaith are, are kind of the same thing. So what did they not believe? Again, Jesus has not been running around screaming from the rooftops, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Messiah. That's not what he's been doing. What do they not believe that's getting in the way of their belief? They didn't believe, because he's from Nazareth, that he was sent from God. They didn't believe even though they saw the miracles, heard all the accounts, they didn't believe, because he was from Nazareth, that he was empowered by God. They didn't believe, like the Pharisees and the scribes, that he was doing God's work. And because they didn't believe any of that, they didn't believe that they were witnessing an inbreaking of the kingdom of heaven into the world and affairs of mankind. So which one is it? He could not or he did not. They distrusted who he was. They, because they didn't trust him and trust who he was, they probably didn't bring very many people to him to be healed. That distrust led directly to their action or, or their inaction, really. And so... He did not because he could not because they did not give him the opportunities to heal many people. Amazed at their unbelief indeed. Imagine what he could have done in his own hometown if they had just believed. Our second picture this morning, now we're finally crossing the bridge into chapter 14. Is about Herod. You know, we're, we're totally changing the, the, the people involved in the story and everything. The story is moving on here. Uh, but it's about Herod and it's about John the Baptist. Here's how it starts. Verse 1. At that time, Herod, this is Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch, he's a regional ruler, heard the news about Jesus. All right, so here we go. Here's the tie-in. The people of Nazareth had heard all about it. They had unbelief. They rejected him. Now we move on to Herod. We've got a a political ruler. He's a regional ruler. Uh, Perhaps you've heard of him if you've been in church for a few few Sundays. Herod the Tetrarch. He's involved in a lot of stuff. All right? He heard the news about Jesus. Here's his response. He said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. Oh, yeah, sure. Sure. Common sense, yeah. He's doing crazy stuff. So he's John the Baptist. Uh, He himself has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Herod is a a deep-thinking, brilliant theologian, is he not? He's got this doctrine of resurrection down pat. Trust me, that ain't Herod. Herod is not a deep-thinking theologian about anything except Herod. Um, this is more superstition and the fact that John uh, is still taking up residence in Herod's head rent-free, okay? So he says, yeah, this guy's doing stuff, and there's also the tie-in that both of them, Jesus and John the Baptist, were preaching the same message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So he hears that, he sees the miracles, John never performed miracles by the way, sees this stuff, knows that they're doing things, people are flocking to him, sees that there's some righteousness there and says, well, he must be him. He must be him because John at this point is dead. All right, John is already gone. Well, how'd that happen? If we were watching a movie right now, we'd get the flashback stuff, okay? This is a flashback. Verse 3, for when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. 
Although Herod wanted him put to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. Herod's life is a soap opera. Okay? We could literally, if, if we wanted to grab something out of the Bible and turn it into a TV series that people today, in the midst of all the filth and smut and everything else that's out there on TV, would actually watch, it would be Herod. This guy is known for his lifestyle that is way out of control. You talk about somebody who lives for the next pleasure, it's him. He decided that he wanted his brother's wife to be his wife. His brother is still alive. This is not one of those Jewish things where if your brother dies, you're responsible uh, to carry on the heirs and everything else. His brother is still alive. And he convinces Herodias, no, you need to be with me. And so she divorces him, comes over, marries Herod, uh, never mind the fact that she's also Herod's niece, you know, just to make it a little more fun. She's also Herod's niece. And so John, being John, who is not afraid of anybody and calls a spade a spade every single time, says, Herod, that's evil and wrong and you shouldn't do it. And evidently, he said it quite often. And he said it quite loudly. And Herod didn't much care for that. So Herod had him arrested. Wouldn't put him to death. John was too well thought of by the rest of the people. It had nothing to do with Herod trying to do the right thing. Herod didn't want the repercussions from upsetting the people by killing John. So he just arrested him and tried to shut him up and make him go away. While he's locked up, Herod's birthday comes along. And as you can imagine, for somebody like Herod, man, this is a blowout. It doesn't say it in here, but there's probably a whole bunch of drinking. It is a drunken, crazy, whatever party. And in the midst of the party, his now shouldn't be, but his wife, her daughter, who at the time was probably about 12 to 14 years old, call it the equivalent of about 18 to 22 nowadays, she comes in and dances for Herod and all of his party guests. No, I am not going to stand up here and show you what a dance looks like. It doesn't say it in there either. It's probably a seductive dance of sorts. And for a bunch of drunken guys like Herod, it put him in a mood to be very generous. And so he tells her, hey, Ask for whatever you want, and I'll give it to you. <laughs> yeah. Why does the Bible say that drunkenness is a sin? Because we're not in control of our faculties. That was a dumb thing for Herod to offer. It was an even dumber thing to follow through on it once she told him what she wanted. This young girl was still young enough that she sought the counsel of her mother to say, Hey, Mom, what, what should I ask for? Herodias was not a nice woman. Herod is cruel, but he's weak. Herodias is cruel, and she is ruthless. And so when Salome, her daughter, goes to her and says, Mom, what should I do? Mom's answer is, I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. It was not a cliché. That's what she meant. And so she took it back to John. There we go. We'll jump back into the story. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. And after being prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And although he was grieved, and don't think grief as in, oh, John the Baptist, no, no, no. Grieved. The king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and his dinner guests. He sent word and had John beheaded in the prison, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. John's disciples came and took away the body and buried it, and they went and reported to Jesus. He wasn't grieved 
because he had any particular affections for John. He was grieved because he knew the fallout that might happen once he actually did this and beheaded him. But what made him follow through with it? He didn't want to be embarrassed in front of his friends, in front of the people that were powerful and influential. He had made a stupid decision to offer this girl whatever she wanted. And then when she told him, he made another stupid decision to follow through with it. Why? Because he didn't want to look bad in front of his friends, in front of the other rulers. Man, if that's not a word that still speaks to people 2,000 years later, I don't know what does. We're all worried about what everybody else thinks. That leads us to do things that we wouldn't do if we were just focused on acting in our belief in Jesus. John oftentimes was compared to Elijah because both prophets confronted the sins of ungodly leadership. Herodias, because of it, had John put to death for the offense of telling the truth. That's what he did. He told the truth. And anyone who speaks the truth of God's word back then, now, doesn't matter when, when when sin is called sin, it is going to be costly. It is costly even now in our culture to call sin, sin. But it is worth it to speak the truth of God every single time. Stand with Christ with conviction. But Matthew here, as we're reading through all this, he's tying together John and Jesus with Herod. Because if you know your, your Bible, you know that this is almost kind of a, a foreshadowing of Jesus' crucifixion as well. The crazy thing is, it's Herod's lack of leadership that led to John's beheading. It was an unbelief in his message of repentance in the kingdom. If Herod had just said, hey, John, I believe you, none of this would have happened. If he had repented and welcomed the kingdom of heaven, we wouldn't be having this same conversation this morning. Pilate sent Jesus to this very same Herod. There there were many Herods. It was almost kind of a a title, so to speak. His brother was Herod Philip. This is Herod Antipas. But this is the same Herod that Jesus was sent to. And if you remember, in Jesus' story, Herod is passive. He doesn't do anything. Pilate sends him, and Herod says, man, I don't know, send him back. He has John. He throws him in the dungeon and says, I don't know what to do with him. I just don't want him out on the streets. But when somebody says, I want him killed, "Eh, all right. He's passive. And that passive role sets the stage for the death of both Jesus and John. So tying all this back together now, Jesus spoke of this gradual growth of the kingdom from very humble beginnings uh, and despite opposition from religious leaders and others. And we're seeing that very clearly now. We've got the people of Nazareth who they just can't get past Jesus' humble beginnings to recognize the truth of who he is. We've got increasing opposition to Jesus' ministry from leadership, government, religious, and an increasingly stark divide between disciples and opposition. And Jesus is very much through these parables and everything else, he is really turning his focus to his disciples. But Herod's story really shows us again the truth that we keep seeing over and over again is that there is no neutral when it comes to Jesus. Herod was passive even though he knew that there was something different and special about John and Jesus both. And in both cases, that passivity led to their deaths. Being passive is not neutral. When we look around today, there is an easiness to unbelief. Not believing in Jesus Christ is easy in our culture why it's everywhere it's why there's so many hard hearts 
for humans, that is our default position until we know Jesus. That's why there's so much cynicism and skepticism out in the world. But why is it so hard to accept a free gift of grace from God? Why is that so hard for people? I think that it's because when you accept a gift like that from God, you have to acknowledge the giver. And when you acknowledge the giver as the one capable of giving the gift, then you've also got to acknowledge his expectations on life and the fact that he has the right to expect them. It's also an an admission that you are no longer the one ultimately in control of your life. People don't like that. The Nazarites, they did not choose to believe in Jesus. That's the same as choosing not to believe in Jesus. Herod didn't choose to let the righteousness of John or Jesus impact his beliefs or his actions. He had other gods that were already in the way. Power, uh, sexual and worldly pleasure, gluttony, hedonism. All those things had crowded out room in his heart for Jesus to be able to be there. There was no place for the rule of the kingdom of heaven, for the reign and rule of Jesus Christ in his heart because it was filled with all that other junk. And we spend every waking moment of our lives trying to fill our lives with stuff. Stuff. Not Christ. Because his heart was full of that stuff, it dictated his awful decisions to maintain other gods in that place in his heart. I don't want to embarrass myself in front of these other people. But unbelief is that default position. It's the starting point for every single man, woman, and child that has ever walked the face of this earth. Don't be surprised by it when you come across it. We see what's going on in the news. We throw our hands up. We can't believe people are acting like this. Why not? How do you expect them to act? They're lost. Expect it. The Bible tells us, expect it. But expect believers to act like believers. You've got to overcome that unbelief to welcome the kingdom of heaven so that you don't miss the blessings like the Nazarites did of Jesus and the kingdom of heaven. Some belief is necessary just to get off the ground. Just to get out of unbelief, there's got to be something that you start sinking your teeth into, you start holding on to, some belief to get moving in the right direction away from sin and death. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to understand and believe everything about the kingdom of heaven for the Holy Spirit to work and to be saved. But you must repent of your sin and recognize that in Jesus, the kingdom of heaven has come near. You've got to recognize that Jesus is from God. He is the way provided for salvation. And you've got to submit to him and seek to obey him. That you've got to do. And you're going to spend the whole rest of your life learning the breadth and depth of who he is and how to follow him and obey him. You're not going to know that from the beginning. As believers, there's still a battle going on between the new self and the old self. Paul writes about it a ton. You can still miss out on the fullness of God's plan and the depths of God's grace. Even as a believer... When you let unbelief gain that toehold in the throne of your heart. And for us as believers, we're called to enter into the world of unbelievers just as Jesus did. That's our mission, to enter into that world. Even though we know 
many of them are not going to have room for Jesus in their hearts. But still, like him in Nazareth, with the few people that they brought forward, we still do everything that we can for them. And we keep our hand to the plow and we keep sowing seeds. Your mission is to sow the seeds and serve the kingdom so that God may be glorified by those who have ears to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That God has made a way through him for our sins to be forgiven and for his children to be reconciled to him. The church, us, we are not simply called to reach out into an unbelieving world and find sick people who need to be made well. Jesus bids us to reach out into a world of dead people and bring them life. We all need to recommit ourselves to supporting a church that preaches and teaches biblical truth just as John did especially as that truth becomes less popular and more persecuted in our disintegrating culture. I would rather have John's head and Christ than have a normal head and miss out on the kingdom. And it is still only through God's power that the dead can be made alive. You know, because of his hard and unbelieving heart, and I'll wrap up here, Herod had no room for the life that he could have had in the kingdom of heaven. Just a reminder, verse 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. That's the, the Nazarites. In, in Nazareth, he couldn't and he didn't do much because they gave him no opportunity in their unbelief. But if we are a believing church, then he can still do the miraculous, and he will. Next week, we're going to look at one of the contrasting pictures to this unbelief uh, that Matthew provides, and he's, he's going to tell us about the growing belief in, in Jesus that the disciples have and, and their growing faith in a story that you've probably heard of before, feeding the 5,000. So hopefully... You'll look forward to that as much as I am. But let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing to life in the Scriptures today these stories of unbelief. Lord, as teaching points for us as ways that we can make sense out of the world that we find ourselves in, a world that we find to be confusing many times as believers. Lord, help us to remember always that it was out of that same world that each and every one of us was saved. Father, help us to remember the compassion, the love that you had for people who were in open rebellion against you when you sent Jesus Christ to live and walk among us. Father, to teach us, but also to die for us. Lord, we are so appreciative of that sacrifice this morning. And we pray that as we read these things, every time we study your word, Father, every time we spend time with you in prayer, every time we're together in fellowship and talking about the the goodness and greatness of God, that it would be fuel for our belief. Father, help, help our belief to be such a deeply rooted part of, in each and every one of us, that it is so deep in our core, that it so permeates every part of our hearts, that it animates everything we do in life. Family, friends, job, vacation, what we read, what we watch on TV, what we do with our kit, whatever it is, that we would be led and guided by you, that we would be seeking to live Christ-like lives, that we would be seeking to show a world 
what the righteousness of Jesus Christ looks like, that we would be pointing others back to him so that their unbelief might be conquered and that they might receive the kingdom of heaven. This morning as Lee sings with us, his altar is open. If you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, I pray that this morning would be that morning. Don't let what anybody else thinks determine your eternal destiny. And at the same time, I know we have many cares on our hearts, many things that we want to lift up for loved ones. I want to invite everyone who's got something to talk to God about this morning to join me at the altar in a moment. I would ask that you join me to pray about God doing miraculous things through our church. I would ask you to pray for the ministry partners that God is preparing to bring to this church to help with what he's doing here. And I would ask that you would pray. Pray for the vision of how God wants to reach this community through our church. Certainly pray for all those who are on your hearts this morning and and whatever they are facing or going through. But now, as we sing, this altar is open. You come. Come.